All right, so I have, I have 50 minutes, is that, is that right? Yeah. Okay, uh, first off, I wanna, I wanna be, uh, uh, say thanks for the, the conference organizers for inviting me to uh, present today. Um, this is a, a great opportunity to make it back to Chicago. I did my PhD at Northwestern University. Now I'm out on the, uh, the West Coast at University of, of Washington. Um, this is a, a particularly interesting topic um, uh, because I think it affects just about everyone in, in the economy. I was in Sydney, Australia uh, yesterday, actually, um, so I've had a long day of traveling. But I was uh, uh, speaking with some, some of my colleagues down there, and they were talking about uh, how people in the investment community had been, talking, had been saying that they don't care what policy the rule makers make just to make one and to stick with it for a while, um, which is exactly what we're getting at. So this is a topic that I think is of, of broad interest. This is an uh, uh, interesting venue to present that because usually I need to spend about 20, 25 minutes simply motivating what in the world is economic policy uncertainty, um, what's sort of the theory behind it, and why do we care. I don't think I need to do that in this audience for some reason. Uh, first off, I spend a good chunk of time talking about the Baker, Bloom, and Davis um, measure, which uh, uh, my co-author, Andrew Detzel, uh, and I extend to an international se uh, setting. Um, second, I need to talk about theory. So I, I talk about Lubos and Pedro's uh, 2011 and 2012 papers. And so we're going to see that. Uh, we're going to see their, their 2011 paper on risk premia uh, tomorrow, uh, the last session, uh, so that everyone has to stick around, I think. Uh, and so I'm not going to go into detail about what the theory says, just that there, there is one out there. It's very, there's two out there. They're both very good papers. Um, but what I'm going to do is focus specifically on, on the tests and implications that we find in, in our paper, um, also because I have a, a restricted amount of time. Uh, I also am more than happy to take questions during the presentation. Um, there's no need to wait till the, till the end. Okay, um, this is the slide that I can kind of skip. Uh, one of them. So first off, we, we know uncertainty matters for asset prices, so this citation list should go on to about 100 probably. At least um, it's uncertainty sort of drives, drives financial markets. Oh, lots of different types of uncertainty or of, of implications have been studied of this. Uh, second is political uncertainty um, as opposed to policy uncertainty. This is an uncertainty more about the political cycle, which gets, it sort of has incorporated within it economic policy uncertainty, but is a broader category. And what uh, Baker, Bloom, and Davis uh, uh, initiated is essentially a research agenda that looks at economic policy uncertainty. And we're going to take a, a, a look at this, particularly in the financial markets. Um, in addition to what, um, to what Scott said about, about why we think this is important, I just want to add two things. First, um, I tend to think of the world as sort of a Thomas Hobbesian place where, where the, the government sets rules, it has hedges. And you and I, economic agents, act within those, those rules. So uh, policy, if you think about it as regulation or taxes, matter a lot with respect to how we can behave. And not knowing what, where the hedges are is uh, uh, relevant for our decision making. Second, if you look at the size of, of the US government, so I'm going to focus on the US uh, uh, a little bit in here, even though this is an international focused paper. Um, the US government, when you include state, federal, and local taxes, uh, uh, expenditure now makes up 42% of GDP. So any changes they make in how they, they, they um, uh, utilize their, their expenditures has implications for other, other agents in the economy. All right, so I'm going to talk about how we measure our uh, economic policy uncertainty. I'm not going to go into as much detail as normally because it's very, very close to the Baker, Bloom, and Davis measure, um, but we need to bring it to an international setting. I'm going to skip the theory altogether. Sorry, uh, uh, Pastor and Veronese, I know you're going to talk about it, so I'll let you, you go into detail on, on that. Uh, talk briefly about the data. Then what I want to look at specifically is stock returns, um, whether or not this economic policy uncertainty can have a detectable impact. Um, try to decompose where the impact is coming from, whether it's from the numerator or the denominator. And finally, look at the persistence of the impact of economic policy uncertainty. Okay, um, the, the, the previous presentation, I think, sort of assumed to everyone that uh, this measure of economic policy uncertainty is good. I tend to agree, um, but let's put it in, in context of where the literature stood sort of before this measure was, was created, created by Baker, Bloom, and Davis, and afterwards. So 
um, many of the previous papers that looked at political uncertainty were uh, focused on more of an, an event study type, type approach. And that is a very uh, useful approach um, as long as you can assume that prior to the event there was high economic policy uncertainty and after the event you switched over to low economic policy uncertainty. Right, so it's sort of a, a snapshot, one-time change. Um, the limitations, are, I think, are, are clear to having a, a uh, one-off type type event analysis. Um, you, you can go a long, long way, but there are limitations. One is that it's, it's a discrete um, event. It's either your high economic policy uncertainty or you're, you're not. Um, it's one time, so if you're looking at like the political cycle for presidential elections, you have something happening every four years. There's a lot of time in between then that uh, you want to pick up variation in policy uncertainty. Uh, third, it's stationary. You're equal weighting every event. And fourth, it's an, an aggregate signal. I think there's, there's more than just policy resolution when there's an election, let's say. Um, uh, there's other information embedded in that event. So with, with a, a continuous measure of economic policy uncertainty, you can uh, look at, look at uh, other questions that, that need sort of a, a time series variation. So um, I have up here, this, I didn't mention it, but this is the uh, example of the debt ceiling being raised that happened in July 2011. So uh, if you were doing an event study around the debt ceiling being raised, you would say prior to the, the debt ceiling um, rule change, there was high uncertainty, afterwards there was low. I think we would all agree that economic policy uncertainty related to the debt ceiling is not low at this point in time, um, given that now we have the fiscal cliff, which is a deviation of the, the um, debt ceiling uh, events. So uh, this is just a very simple example, but if you were to look at a time series of events leading up to the debt, uh, the debt policy ceiling um, being raised, if you looked at like, January 2011, it looked like Congress and the White House were getting along. Same within February. Uh, they, they were getting along a little bit less well in February. Then March comes, they maybe are getting along a little bit better. Uh, we come to June 2011, it looks like there's no agreement that's going to happen. And then the last couple of days of June, before the debt ceiling is actually raised, it, it sort of becomes clear that they're going to pass a bill. This is sort of the state of the world after the debt ceiling is raised. Um, but one of the, one of the uh, reasons why the debt ceiling was passed was that in November 2011, a, a committee was going to get together and they were going to figure out sort of what is the what are, what are the compromises we're going to have to make so that we can um, balance the budget in the future? Um, October comes around. It's unclear whether or not this, this, is, uh, this committee is going to do what they were uh, tasked to do. November passes. They don't come to an agreement. So we go into sort of full-on um, fiscal cliff uh, uh, mode. And hopefully, we get resolution about this shortly. But, but what this is supposed to capture is that there's a lot more nuanced time series variation and economic policy uncertainty than um, sort of a one-off event. Okay, that's all the motivation I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to pass over the theory on why we would expect asset prices to be impacted by economic policy uncertainty, and I'm going to get right to the data that, that we use in our study. So we use an a international uh, set of countries. We're going to have 21 countries in our database. We picked these 21, 21 countries because they have stock markets that have a valuation on January 1st, 2011 of over $500 billion. Um, our stock returns are going to be monthly. We're going to use the data stream total return index, which includes dividends. It's, um, it captures about 75% of the stock market valuation for each particular country. In addition, we're going to need to, one of our, our dependent variables is going to be cash flows, and we're going to proxy for that by some macroeconomic variables, in particular GDP, private investment, private consumption, and government expenditures. These come from the IMF. Um, finally, we're going to want to control for business cycle uh, implication, uh, effects, and so we're going to in, get data from IMF as well for the market dividend yield, um, a country's short-term interest rate, its, and its long-term interest rate. Now to the measure, we're going to start by uh, Andrew and I uh, give full credit to Baker, Bloom, and Davis the, uh, for, for coming up with this, this very uh, creative and novel measure. Um, we are going to use it and extend it to an international setting. We have to make some tweaks to it, though, so it's, it's appropriate in this setting. 
Um, let me talk exactly about what we do similar to their measure and what we do different. So uh, the Baker, Bloom, and Davis paper, at least the earlier version, focused on the, the US uh, um, measure of economic policy uncertainty. And it goes in depth with respect to exactly how that, uh, uh, how, how economic policy uncertainty is related to other measures of uncertainty, how they, they calculate it. Um, I really like this new component about breaking it down by types of economic policy uncertainty. I think that's really uh, useful and it's actually a comment that I've, I've received a couple times before. So I'm interested to see what your, your results show with the, the breakdown. Um, we also do a monthly search term and our terms are going to be similar. They're going to try to capture the same thing. Um, but there's going to be some, some differences. So I already mentioned international. Shorter, we start in 1990 as opposed to 1985 because of news, uh, uh, electronic files uh, limitations. There just isn't a lot of electronic news before 1990. Even though the database that we, we get this from starts in 1980, it's just essentially empty the first 10 years. Um, we're only going to look at news and magazines, although we don't restrict it to just the, the sort of top 10 in each country. As long as you're a news or magazine where you include, we include you in our, our source and our, our analysis. And finally, our source is all access news, um, which is similar to like a LexisNexis, but focused on global uh, newspapers. OK. Let me get into specifically how we calculate our, our measure of economic policy uncertainty. Um, first, Ac World Access News uh, has about 190 million observations. It has 6,300 uh, newspapers. Like I said, it's from 1982 today. What, um, what, what was a concern when we started with this project was that if we're going to do this in an international setting, are we going to have to do this search um, in 20 different languages, or however many different languages those 21 countries that I, that I uh, showed earlier um, have newspapers. Um, it turns out all access news, um, uh, all, all world news, access world news uh, translates their articles into English. Uh, my conjecture is that this is an automated translation, and it's probably not perfect. And as a result, we need to be a little bit more flexible in what we mean by uncertainty. Um, which gets me to sort of the, the criteria we have for our, our search-based engine. Um, first is in order for uh, uh, uncertainty, an article to be attributed to a country, it has to have that country's name in it. I think that's a, a obvious one. Um, it doesn't matter the source of the news, actually. It could be from a US-based newspaper or an Australian-based newspaper. If it's talking about Hong Kong uncertainty, it's a Hong Kong, it goes into the Hong Kong measure. Um, so we're not that concerned about where it's coming from. Our second is trying to pick up the same sort of uncertainty type terms that Baker, Bloom, and Davis use, but we were a little more um, broad because our, our international colleagues at University of Washington said that uncertainty may not translate well uh, from other countries. And so um, maybe other people who uh, English as second language uh, have similar thoughts. We'd be happy to know other words that uh, maybe pick up what, uh, what would be the right translation from other, other countries for uncertainty. Finally, with respect to government policy, we include, I think these are the exact same ones that Baker, Bloom, and Davis um, include in their, their measure. These capture the same ones. One that we do include, I think, is central bank. I'm not sure if you had that because the Federal Reserve, of course, is only US. Yeah, yeah. OK. Um, we also normalize by news intensity uh, so that we have a, a scared variable. We're going to take the natural log of everything. Um, so we can say, say effects in um, percent of changes. OK, quick snapshot. I, I think people in this room have done mostly uh, screen scraping before. Um, the number we're interested in here when we do our search for political uh, news uncertainty is this all results, 8,995. Um, we, we essentially just grab that number. Uh, we don't really care about others. You'll see that the first result is uncertainty on Bernanke vote raises fears. We did not have six undergraduates go through and read all of these. Um, uh, one of the nice things about being the second paper, or whatever, whatever number of paper we are, is we can say, refer back to the Baker, Bloom, and Davis for the validity of this, this measure. Ours is supposed to be a similar measure for an international setting. Uh, so just to show sort of how close, or yeah. It is, yes. Yeah, so we could so, we could decompose. Like, 
Yeah. I mean, it, I'm not saying that that wouldn't matter then, or that it would uh, change it heavily, but it is certainly key for like yeah. Anglo. Um, That's a. With the, that is a good idea. We could exclude U.S. newspaper, U.S. or U.K. newspapers, and redo the analysis to see if we get a similar similar effect. That, I like that suggestion. Um, for comparison, we show our measure in the, the solid blue line compared to the uh, B, B, and D uh, news-based measure. Um, we don't use the other other two factors. We focus just on the news, partly because uh, it's difficult to get those measures in in other countries. Um, there is a high correlation. It's about a 0.66 correlation between the two. Uh, I would say ours tends to mean revert more quickly. Other than that, we haven't really done much um, statistical analysis on the comparison between the two. All right. Uh, here are what the summary statistics look like for our economic uncertainty measure for our 21 countries. Uh, the, low, the lowest uh, economic policy uncertainty country is India. Um, the highest is, is Hong Kong. Remember, this is during 1999 to 2012. Uh, I, I think the, uh, the um, Hong Kong uh, uh, no longer being part of the, the um, British Empire is, is part of this, uh, uh, partly why we, we see this exposure. The United States, you'll see in here, uh, is sort of right in the, oh, that's the wrong one, is right in the middle with 2.85, uh, or 2.8% of articles having, um, uh, So the, their news is just about like crime. It could be. It could be that they just don't talk about the. Um, yeah. it, it certainly could be. Or especially like born in the 90s, Russia. That was a lot about crime. <laughs> they had bigger problems on their hands. Um, that's that's a valid point. Um, Russia is, was one of the few countries actually where we aren't able to get data until 1998 um, for the the macro. So we don't start the. Uh, uh, the time series for them until a little bit later. But that, that's true. It could be, it, we're, we're, it turns out we're not going to care really about the level uh, anyways, because we're, we're going to do country fix effects, so we take away all the, the mean very, uh, anyways. But uh, uh, just interesting to see the cross-sectional um, variation among the countries. We create this second measure called general uncertainty, which is really just the volatility of that stock, of the, of the stock market for that country, um, a daily measure of returns, uh, the volatility for the month. Um, if you look at the correlation between the two, I think it's about 0.2, um, so not incredibly high. Okay, um, we also show our measure compared to VIX. Uh, we have a much lower correlation, it's about 0.16, I think. Um, so what, what, what we take this as is we're picking up something sort of other than financial uncertainty. It's something that, to the extent that economic policy uncertainty is embedded in VIX, um, um, there's something that we're picking up above and beyond that. Okay, now let's get to the, the basic tests. Um, uh, uh, I'm yeah. just curious, is it right to go up against like a general account national election? I'm just curious. Do you have any spike? Because we, of the election paper here, the, the, the BB&D index does that, and they show that there's a spike right around the elections. Um, we, we, just, um, we, haven't, we haven't lined it up, but we, we could for the international version and see if, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so the first test is a very, very simple one. We want to know whether or not stock returns are, uh, ha are related or with uh, economic policy uncertainty. We're going to do just about everything in first differences. Um, where our returns are going to be excess returns throughout. Um, when we say EPU with a subscript T minus 1, that means economic policy uncertainty that we measure from the start of month T minus 1 until the end of month T minus 1. Um, and so period T would be the, the next observation. There'd be no overlap between the two. Um, a very simple specification. I is going to be sort of taking different um, uh, definitions based, based on what type of uncertainty we want to capture. We want to make sure that we're not just capturing some sub, subsection of general uncertainty, that, that volatility of stock price measure that I suggest that I mentioned in the previous slide, and that we're capturing something above and beyond that. Um, so we're going to include both of those in our regressions. 
And I, the, the null hypothesis is that economic policy uncertainty doesn't affect stock, stock prices. Maybe this is a straw man, but it's a starting point. You're not including any, like, effects not here. We'll get there. Yeah. Um, so, you know, before doing the empirical test, we do a little graphical test showing um, our measure, again, in the blue line versus the uh, U.S. monthly returns. You can obviously see the relationship in this, this graph, right? Um, there's a correlation of about 0.1. It's, it's positive, but uh, this, this is why we need to do statistical tests. No, I, I enjoy them. Yes, it is possible. Um, I'll, we address that. So, no, 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 this is, uh, <laughs> it means my slides are in the right order, right? That you're asking the, the next slide. Um, okay, so let's start with regression one, column, which is column one. Um, here, we're very simple specification. We include country fixed effects and everything. Everything is double clustered, standard errors. Um, all we're including is the change in economic policy uncertainty in period T and the stock return for country, uh, uh, for, for, sorry, the change in economic policy uncertainty for country J in period T and the stock return for country J in period T um, over that same interval. So these are contemporaneous effects. There's a, a negative effect. When economic policy uncertainty increases by 1%, stock returns tend to, de to decrease by 2.9%. I don't know if this is, I don't think this is surprising because when uh, economic policy uncertainty is sort of discussed in the news, it's because this is on people's minds. Maybe it's because the stock market went down. So there's an endogeneity issue when you look at the contemporaneous effect. Uh, yeah? We, we could. Um, would we, need, we would have to make the, the EPU measure on a daily basis, right? Yeah. It was the noise that... <laughs> yeah, um, we could try that. We could definitely try that. It's, it's very costless to go from monthly to, to daily with the, the measures, right? So. Um, there was also a look at the interaction between those. It would be interesting to look at the interaction between media, media freedom. They can be all the two media, things like that's, lack, of, lack of news and bad news, like Argentina <laughs> stopped announcing their foreign currency results. That was the right, right. Market. Right. Well, if you, if you look at the theory papers, economic policy uncertainty doesn't have to be bad news. It could be that the policy is so bad that they're, fine, they're going to change it. And so the uncertainty, regardless of what the outcome is, is going to be better than the previous uh, um, uncertainty. But it wouldn't be true in this code that you mentioned. Probably in this paper in the US, it's more likely to report that Argentina stopped reporting that than <laughs> Right. Let, let, let me keep going. Um, <laughs> I, I think with this, this measure, you can uh, uh, have a long, long, long debate. Um, we, look at, we look at uncertainty with respect to, to volatility, show that when there's more volatility in the market, stock returns tend to be lower. What we're really interested in is what we're picking up. Is this just really is a subset of, uh, econ of uh, is EPU really just a subset of market uncertainty? Um, when we combine them both in a, a regression, both have negative um, coefficients that are statistically significant. And in fact, the, if you look at the adjusted R squared, it essentially just adds, adds up, which suggests that we're picking up um, two different components of, um, of uncertainty here. So we move on from the um, contemporaneous effect to the uh, one period ahead effect. Uh, in particular, we're interested in, this is sort of a, a first approach at looking at a risk premium effect that economic policy uncertainty may be having. Um, so instead of having our, in the, our I, I variable be period T, we have been period T minus one, and returns are still period T. Um, again, we, here we're going to use levels because we think that if there is a risk premium effect, it's not going to show up in the change, it's going to show up in the, the level. Uh, but we, we repeat the analysis, um, this time using the lagged and contemporaneous economic policy uncertainty, and the coefficients are suggestive that last period's economic policy uncertainty will result in a high return this period. 
Um, we're going to dig deeper into this question, but this bring, suggests that uh, that there is a a risk prima uh, effect as predicted by the uh, um, Pastor and, and Veronese papers. Um, when you look at uncertainty, you get a similar sign. Um, when you combine them all together, you lose some of the statistical significance for, for economic policy and certain degree of T, but everything is still, still um, statistically significant at the 10% um, level, was one star, or five? 10% 10, 10 level, okay. Thank you. Um, okay, so that takes us, that's sort of the, the first step of our, our analysis. We show that there, we show uh, this relationship between returns and, and economic policy uncertainty. Which brings us to a lot more questions, I think. First is, if this is a risk premium story, we should expect to see that economic policy uncertainty affects volatility of the stock market as well. Um, it's hard to have a risk premium if, if there really is no more additional risk as a, as a result of, of this measure. So uh, our null hypothesis is going to be that our economic policy uncertainty does not affect volatility. Um, we're going to start with the contemporaneous, and then we're going to look at the, the, lagged, vol uh, the lagged economic policy uncertainty. So if you look at the dependent variable here is the change in volatility for country J in period T. Our independent variable in the first, first uh, column, first regression, is not statistically significant. Um, we're going to include lagged volatility because uh, volatility tends to, be, tends to be persistent. We don't get significance when we include just the contemporaneous um, relationship. When we include the lagged relationship, though, economic policy uncertainty does predict future volatility. When you include them together, when you include both the lagged in the contemporaneous, um, you, you both are significant. But this suggests that a 1% uh, increase in economic policy uncertainty increases the um, increases volatility by about 18. Uh, 18% contemporaneous or 26% when you look at the, the lag effect. Maybe this is really just a business cycle effect. Um, the Pastor and Veronese uh, uh, theory papers suggest that the risk premium should vary with, with the business cycle. Um, and so we want to make sure that throughout the rest of the paper we're controlling for, for the business cycle. So to capture this, we're going to include dividend yield. Um, TSP is the difference between the, um, uh, the high yield rate, uh, interest rate for a country, and the low yield interest rate for a country, and bill is the, the low yield interest rate for a country. When we include our business cycle controls, the, the, result, the result persists. Okay, so this suggests that um, this is consistent with economic policy uncertainty yesterday impacting uh, volatility today. So because we're doing things at a, a stock market level, uh, at a country level, we're going to um, now dive into whether or not we have a numerator or a denominator effect. Uh, by that, I mean a cash flow effect or a discount effect. Uh, for the cash flow effect, we're going to use um, GDP and its, its components, except net exports, uh, and see whether or not the economic policy uncertainty affects these. Um, economic policy uncertainty today affects tomorrow's um, cash flows. It's GDP or investment or consumption. Because this data are quarterly, we need to take our monthly variable and create it into a quarterly variable. Um, and the null hypothesis is that uh, after, after controlling for leg GDP as well as for country fixed effects, that the change in economic policy uncertainty yesterday should not affect, uh, should not affect GDP or an investment today. Each column, again, is a different regression. Dependent variable is the change in either GDP, investment, consumption, or government. We find a strong effect in GDP overall, which suggests that when um, economic policy uncertainty increases 1%, uh, government uh, GDP expenditure decreases by about 6.7 basis points the next quarter. When you de decompose it, you can see the effect is mostly coming from investment, slightly from consumption, and government expenditures don't really change. Uh, and so this, the interpretation here is that there is a cash flow effect. Um, both the, when you, I'm just in, in our, our model on our heads is a very simple Gordon growth model. Um, the future cash flows decrease as a result of an increase in economic policy uncertainty. Yeah. We have not broken it down. Uh, Yeah. 
Yeah. You don't see it. Mm. I haven't looked for the data internationally. Um, I'm thinking we would be able to get it, um, but we'll definitely look at that. Another, um, yeah, that's that's a great suggestion. Thank you. We'll we'll look at that. Yeah. Ah, okay, so we're, because they're just uh, smoothing essentially, we're not picking it up. That could be. Right, right. Well, we should look farther into that. Thank you. Okay, um, let's look at the denominator effect now. This, uh, we're going to, later on, um, do I, uh, how much time do I have left? Okay. Um, Later on, we'll do this in a, we'll, we'll do uh, some, some discount uh, or a, uh, risk premia effects um, internationally, but we're going to focus on the U.S. right now because we're going to go into stock-specific uh, data, and it's uh, a much, e much better understood market with what other risk premia factors we should be looking at um, in the U.S. as opposed to when you go internationally. What we're going to do is we're going to essentially make a long, short portfolio around our economic policy on certain coefficient for U.S. stocks. So we're going to run a, a, um, run a regression with the Palma French factors uh, and with our law, uh, natural log of EPU. We're going to rank stocks based on the beta of the, that regression results. We're going to use a five-year rolling window. And then we're going to look at the, the um, stock returns for these different portfolios in the next, the next month. When you do this, EPU 1 meaning you have the highest exposure to economic policy uncertainty, EPU 5 meaning you have the lowest exposure, um, you find that over the 20 year sample, uh, it, oh, excuse me, the 20 year sample, uh, you'll get uh, the next month's return will be on average uh, 1.43. Uh, percent where for, for EPU1 for high economic policy uh, uncertainty exposure and uh, for low economic policy uncertainty it's statistically insignificant or about in a, and in fact coefficient is about half the other one um, the difference is about a 62 basis point um, uh, long short portfolio return we're not controlling yet here for our other risk factors that we know have a, a effect on stock return um, uh, stock returns. So what I described earlier was what we do to get, do the first stage. We do the, the Palm French factors and we include our beta on economic policy uncertainty and this is the coefficient that we sort on. What we're going to do to more formally verify that we're in fact picking up something else than the, the three factors. In fact, we're going to look at the five factors. Um, in, in addition to high minus low, small minus big in market, we're going to include momentum and we're going to include uh, the liquidity factor, uh, past our assemble. Uh, we're doing this after we have sorted our returns in the portfolios, and we're trying to predict that portfolio's returns. Again, each column is a regression for the different um, bin of economic policy uncertainty stocks that we sorted and, and um, regrouped every, every month. The alpha um, for the low bin uh, is reduced. It's now 82 basis points, but the alpha for the High or sorry, low, low economic policy exposure is also reduced to 0.21 um, basis, 12.1 um, basis points. So you get a 70 basis point monthly return from this long short portfolio. Something that that we we want to explore further because I think this might have a lot of interesting economic content is look at momentum. Moment, momentum is statistically uh, negative and strongly statistically significant. Um, we want to know whether or not our economic policy uncertainty is, in fact, has something to say about momentum. That's where I think the, uh, the future research will be taking us, because this, uh, this could give an economic story, actually, to, econo to momentum.
That's right. We've only done this in the, in the U.S., but you're saying that if we do it cross-sectionally, well, across. Kind of doubt, but one extreme you take, um, and depending on the government really matches, there is a lot of equipment. Something where it doesn't. Yeah. But, uh, you know, you can think of radio shares of the ETF sent to the government, the molecule of the ETF shares sent to the government. Yeah. Break it down into countries where, you know, like, you know, like, you know, like, you know, like, Seventy basis points. Yeah. Um, I actually don't recall what uh, I don't recall what like the. This this would be seventy basis points monthly. Per month. That's that's large. Yeah, that's eight and a half percent. Um, we have some some. Uh, uh, Friends who are in the, in uh, practitioners and they are implementing this and we'll see if it actually uh, works in practice. So that's pretty good. Well, yeah, yeah. And well, so one one issue is always is how much are we going to eat up in transaction costs? How much rebalancing do we have to do? We do these five. We have long sort of rolling windows because this is monthly, but um, there's not a lot of switching between stocks, and so the transaction costs should be relatively low. Yeah, yeah, the high turnover. Right, right. Yeah, Lula. If you think a minus contract calculates the table? We, uh, it's simply through this regression done at a stock level in the, for U.S. stocks um, using five years of previous uh, uh, monthly returns. That's right. There's no forward-looking information. We uh, we do this in robustness checks that we don't report in the paper. Uh, either does it completely disappear, or does it just greatly reduce? Uh, Right. Okay. Yeah. So the the interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. That we should be careful with the, the interpretation because it is a. I think in the paper we do call it a, a type of risk. I mean, it's not a, sort of this risk-free return, but it's a type of risk um, compensation. Well, it used to be. All, it's a uh, uh, undiscovered beta. I think is what a recent uh, uh, AQR report uh, said. It's 1990 to 2012. So the training period is five years. So we, yeah, so we start 1995, um, January 1, I guess. Right. Huge variation in the quality of the Right. What I want, I want you to extend your sample back to like 1930, and then we can redo this uh, on your on your on your measure. Uh, that's what I I would prefer that. Uh, but we're working on it. So so um, I didn't in the paper. I believe we have a time series of the risk premia, and it lines up very very well the Pastor and Veronese's paper in that you see the pay, the payoffs for this risk premia are very high in recession times. Um, that's when they they spike. Yeah. Yeah, this is only U.S. Um, so we can look at whether it, it, it may just depend on the type of government where you see this this uh, effect. Yeah. So 
So uh, what, would the, what would the second sort be? On, on a, we, we could do that. We could do that. Um, I mean, that would be directly tied to the past, the past and easy model, right? Is that that um, the, uh, the state of the economy matters for the risk premium. Yeah. All right. I know I'm supposed to then. OK, good. Thank you. Uh, all right, so we showed things contemporaneous. Uh, we showed sort of one-time effects. Now we want to know about persistence. Um, we're we're going to look both at persistence, persistence of the uh, cash flows as well as persistence of the um, uh, the discount rate. There's three different sort of possible, four different possible outcomes. Well, three different possible outcomes. Excuse me. One is that it's temporary. This would be like a uh, McDonald and, and Siegel. Uh, real options type analysis that they temporarily hold back investment, let's say, and then next period they, they overinvest. And so the actual effect is just a delay of one, of one month in the, the output. Second is that it could be one of two different types of permanent effects. It could be a level effect whereby um, you see a, a maybe a short-term shock to investment, but then growth resumes as it would otherwise. It doesn't overcompensate for the, the, low, the bad month or quarter, um, but it resumes growth thereafter. Finally, which is probably the, the worst impact, is it could be a slope, slope shift in that you have a bad effect this quarter. And in addition, in the future, you continue to have subpar growth as a result of a change in economic policy uncertainty today. Um, so what we, what we do is an um, autogressive distributed leg model. It's, we essentially just repeat what we did in the earlier cash flow analysis, but instead of having one um, change in economic policy uncertainty. We have eight legs of economic policy uncertainty. Um, we just re reproduce the final re result with all eight legs. It appears that the effect is permanent, but a level shift. You don't see a, a slope change. After the first month, after the initial economic policy uncertainty in T minus one, only next, next quarter's GDP is affected. When you, when you have a two period, two period leg between the two, the statistical significance just it, it goes away. Um, this suggests that it's a, a permanent level, level shift for cash flows. Let me get to the um, discount rates with my five minutes remaining. Uh, you're looking at persistence. So we're going to do a little bit further analysis here. And I, I hope I have enough time to explain things clearly. But we're going to start with looking at cumulative returns over larger and larger windows up, uh, adding one month at a time, going from the contemporaneous returns to the uh, two-year cumulative return window. Looking at an economic policy uncertainty level in period T minus one, and then the change in period T. Um, what are predictions? Uh, let's, first off, let's, let's, let's look at just the raw return, the raw excess returns. We're going to dig deeper into this in a second, but let's look at what happens when you um, look at just raw returns. So each, we switched up sort of the um, reporting here because it needs to fit on one page. Um, so now each row is a regression. And the regression is done based on uh, the, the horizon, which is going to be how far T plus U is in the future. So the first one is just the contemporaneous return. The second column, or second row is, is the um, one month in the future cumulative return. The third column would be two months in the future cumulative return, et cetera. The variable that we're, we're most interested in here is change in economic policy uncertainty. Um, we already know that there is a decrease in economic policy uncertainty. Or excuse me, there's a decrease in returns when economic policy uncertainty increases. This is the contemporaneous effect. When you move down the, the, uh, the horizon, the effect goes away. There's no longer any influence of economic policy uncertainty from yesterday on today's stock returns. But this is really problematic because we're including both the discount rate in here, as well as any shocks that are going on with respect to stock prices. And the shocks can add a lot of noise. So what we're going to do is we're going to decompose returns into uh, the expected return, which is our, our sort of measure of the discount rate, and uh, unexpected return, which is sort of surprises from new news. We're going to use the same measure as Santa Clara and Valkanov uh, in their 2003 JF paper that looks at uh, um, the stock returns during Democrat and Republican um, uh, uh, presidents, and uh, what the measure does is essentially 
uh, again, you have excess returns on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side are measures we used previously for, to measure the business cycle. Um, DP was dividend yield, TSP is the spread in, in yield, uh, in, the, in the yield rates. Bill is the low interest rate, volatility is the SSA volatility. Um, and uh, this regression is, we're gonna do it for each country. Um, and then we're gonna get coefficients for beta one through five for each country. We're going to use, use those um, coefficients uh, for our, our equation to determine what the expected return is for country J in period T. Um, the residual is gonna be our unexpected return, the part that we can explain, uh, with the interpretation being that the, um, the expected return is the, the discount rate, essentially. Okay, so when you look at the residual component, you get the same, same you, you get that negative immediate effect happening right away. This is the, the negative to some percent when you have a 1% increase in economic policy uncertainty. I'm gonna focus on the changes in economic policy uncertainty and just not, not the levels. Um, more interestingly, when you look at the expected returns, you can see a sizable effect that persists over time. There's not an immediate impact to the, um, to the to expected returns, which you might expect given that this is new information being embedded into prices about sort of what, uh, what, what macro risk there's going to be in the future that investors may want to be compensated for. But even starting in period one, you start to see about a 67 basis point increase in, um, in expected returns. And this is very consistent with the risk premium that we showed when we were doing the cross section in, in the US. Uh, as you go from, from one month in the future to a, 20, a total a two year horizon of cumulative returns, um, you keep your statistical significance. The coefficient starts to level out after about T15, T16 um, for the, the change in economic policy uncertainty from period T. So up to a year and a half in the future, you still see a higher risk, uh, a total expected returns being higher. I just had the two minute warning, I have about one minute left now. So I just want to conclude, um, to summarize what our, what our findings were. Uh, so, so we, we uh, are standing on the shoulders of giants after the BB&D index um, uh, and extending the, model, the measure to an international setting where we're looking just at asset, asset pricing effects. Um, we show that there is an uh, increase in risk premium with economic policy uncertainty and that cash flows appear to be decreasing, um, both things which we we think affect stock returns. In addition, we saw that these are sizable and persistent effects, especially their premia is, is quite persistent over time. Um, and so we think that economic policy uncertainty is something that uh, matters and that we need to be, we need to be thinking more, more about in, in finance and economics in general. Thank you. Thank you.